Hello. Um, so for today, we'll formally begin our um, study of the regularity of weak solutions to elliptic PDEs in divergence form. So in the previous video, it's more of like a preliminary intro thing where we talked about like why are elliptic PDEs interesting and uh, we did a brief recall as to what weak uh, derivatives are, what weak solutions are, and where's the value in trying to look for weak solutions and stuff like that. So for today, uh, we'll be sort of talking a little bit about um, the uh, the general picture, I guess, uh -huh, as to what we're gonna do. But mostly what we're going to focus on are more of preliminaries again. In particular, um, we are going to show that uh, if you can control the, uh, the growth of certain integrals, then it guarantees you um, Hilder continuity. So we'll talk more about these later. And so let's get started. Okay. So we consider the following problem. So we have here negative divergence of a grad u plus c u equals f in omega. And from here on, omega is going to be uh, a bounded open subset of Rn with a uh, nice boundary. Uh -huh. So it's, it's going to be as nice as we want it to be. Excuse me. And we have zero Dirichlet conditions. Uh -huh. So this is um, uh, an elliptic PD in divergence form. And the goal is to look at weak solutions to this of this one and say something about their regularity. And when we say regularity, like um, how nice are they? Uh -huh. So let's see. So we say that uh, U is a weak solution. So let's call this equation star weak solution of star if uh, the following holds integral of a grad u dot grad phi plus c u phi is equal to f phi for every phi in h1 zero of omega so this is a sublim space uh, we sort of talked about this last time okay so it's a weak solution if the following is satisfied for every test function. So it's a weak solution because you require less of u. Uh, I forgot to mention that, let's sort of move it. So this is the second condition, let's call it two. The first condition is u must be in H10. Okay, now let's, uh, I didn't say something yet about, uh, I didn't say anything yet about uh, the coefficients here. So we impose the following things on the coefficients. So where, uh -huh. one, we want the AIJs, the entries in the coefficient matrix, they're functions of X, uh, we want them to be bounded. So it's in L infinity. So this is bounded almost everywhere. Uh, and that the following holds, there exists positive constants, little lambda, big lambda, such that the following matrix inequality holds, lambda i less than or equal to a of x, less than or equal to big lambda i, i is the identity matrix, um, almost everywhere, x and omega. And what this matrix inequality means is you have that for every vector v in rn you have that little lambda uh, norm of v uh, euclidean norm of v squared is less than or equal to a v of lambda v uh -huh. so we call this an ellipticity condition in the literature and i also want to point out that this condition here actually guarantees that a is in uh, l infinity Okay, I, I think, uh -huh. okay. Now the second condition uh, that we're imposing are for the other coefficients. And so we want C to be in L n over two of omega. 
and we want f to be in l of 2n over n plus 2 of omega, okay? So uh, in the book that I'm using, so I'm using this book, uh, it's uh, Elliptic Partial Differential Equations by Han and Lin. Um, so it's a very nice book. I, I, I really like it. So they talk about uh, not just uh, weak solutions to divergence form PDEs, but also weak solutions as well. It's very nice. Um, so in the book, they just mentioned that you need these. So uh, these are the minimal assumptions that you have uh, coming from the Sobolev inequality. Now, um, and they didn't like say any more. So what I want my channel to be is it's for graduate students, and I, like I'm I'm sure like, um, we share the same <laughs> sentiments when it comes to like studying mathematics. Like oftentimes the author would say something like, "Okay, uh, this is true," but and then you'll be like why is that true or what does it mean so the point of this channel is so it's for graduate students i'll try to flesh out uh a lot of the details as much as i can so that uh or we we could also like work through it together and stuff like that and i think it, this was something that um i don't know i feel like i would have appreciated <laughs> more from from my study although there is there is some um value in working it out on your own uh-huh so yeah there's that okay so going back let's see um so like what the authors say uh, these are the minimum assumptions uh so that your equation makes sense and in particular what that means is so that these integrals make sense for every test function t okay so let's just demonstrate why that is true quickly so let's focus on the first term. So for the first term, this appears as the integral of c u phi over omega. And note that u and phi, each of these are in h10, okay? Okay, so by uh, Hilder inequality, this is going to be less than or equal to, um, let's give uh, c some alpha power there to be determined in that u this is l2 star phi l2 star now the 2 star here this is the sobolev exponent and uh, this is the exponent that comes from the sobolev inequality so uh, we were talking about last time that being in a sobolev space gives you better integrability so um, W12 a priori is um, the functions are L2 integrable, but more than that, uh, if it's in W12, you can actually say something more that it's going to be integrable to a higher power. And that higher power, you can do this, I think. Um, there are some like technicalities, uh, but for our purposes, um, roughly I'm being very rough about here, uh, U is going to be in L2 star, and 2 star is going to be bigger than 2. Now, what is 2 star? What is the Sobolev uh, exponent? So, here, uh, 2 star inverse is equal to 1 over 2 minus 1 over n. So, for our purposes here on out, n is bigger than 2. So, we are, uh, and p is equal to 2. So, we are in the case that p is less than n. Okay, so all the inequalities and all, uh, therefore, the p equals less than n case, unless stated otherwise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and then computing this, what is this? This is 2n, you have n minus 2. Okay, so that, so that 2 star is equal to um, 2n over n minus 2. And then we compute what alpha is now. So from Hilder inequality, we want that the reciprocal of these things the sum of them must be equal to 1. So that tells us that 1 over alpha must be equal to 1 minus twice of 2 star inverse. So that is what? 1 minus um, n minus 2 over n. And this is n, n minus n plus 2. So this is 2 over n, which tells us that alpha is n over 2. So, sorry. So we have alpha is equal to n over 2. So that is sort of the minimum 
uh, assumption that you can impose on the uh, integrability on C so that the integral makes sense. So n over 2, n over 2, okay. Now you sort of do the same for uh, f, okay. Uh, it looks kind of scary, but this is, uh, this is fairly straightforward to do. So f appears in this term here. So the question is, um, what conditions should I impose on f? Minimal one so that this makes sense for every phi. So you do Hilder inequality again, less than or equal to, let's give it an alpha power there. This is L2 star. So we compute directly what alpha is. So one over alpha must be one minus uh, two star inverse. And this is equal to one minus N minus two over two N. So this is two N, two N minus N plus two. This is N plus two over two N. So that alpha is equal to 2n over n plus 2. And we get this magic expression here. Okay. So, yeah. Uh -huh, there's that. Okay. So, just a little segue. <laughs> it's, it's very, like, um, validating to, uh, to figure out, like, what the author means. Uh -huh. And maybe I'm taking away a, a bit from the experience from you. Uh -huh. So... Yeah, you're 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 free to sort of figure out possibility and figure out why these exponents make sense or when we're at an, uh at a calculation stuff that I'm gonna flesh out. Yeah, you you can pause and try to work it out on your own. Okay. So our goal Okay. So the goal ultimately is to obtain interior regularity results. So to be just a bit more precise about that, we are going to show that u is going to be C alpha under some conditions. And um, for stronger conditions, we can say something a bit more, u is going to be in C1 alpha. So we show that even their derivatives are C alpha. And note that these are in the interior. So they're inside the domain. So we're not looking at like uh, continuity up to the boundary and stuff like that. So, um, and what Han and Lin uh, do, does, mm -hmm. in their book, uh, they sort of divide it into two. So the first one is by perturbation methods, where the, uh, the guiding principle is you, so the idea is you compare with a constant coefficient uh, uh, equations, sort of. So what, what you compare per se is you compare the solutions. Uh -huh. So let's see if I can demonstrate the idea here. Just a very quick idea. So I'm going to disregard the integrals, but we're going to uh, see uh, this calculation uh soon but not today okay so just to illustrate the point uh-huh so at, uh when we're doing the regularity calculations we'll be seeing things like this like aij of x uh partial i u of x partial j phi of x is equal to f of x mm -hmm. we are going to need uh solutions uh that are or functions that are aharmonic, meaning to say uh, you have aij uh, of x0, um, uh, az, ax0 harmonic, uh -huh. uh, so to say, uh, partial iw of x and partial uh, j phi of x uh, is equal to 0, uh -huh, which is a constant coefficient sort of thing. Uh -huh. I'm being like very very loose about it like uh, they're, they're gonna be defined uh, these actually hold uh, um, on in, in uh, there are integrals present here but I just sort of want to demonstrate this perturbation thing okay so what we're gonna do here is so for the first equation uh-huh we can uh, sort of write it as AI, sorry, AIJ of X minus, let's, the added terms, let's write it in a different color, minus AIJ of X zero 
plus aij of x0 and you have partial partial iu partial j phi equals f uh-huh and then uh for the second one you have aij x0 partial iw partial j phi equals zero so what we're gonna do is uh we are going to um, combine certain terms together in particular we we are sort of looking at this one and then take note of this term as well so sort of subtracting and rearranging it sort of give us something like so what do we get um this minus this so uh, uh, this minus this so that gives us a aij of x0 of partial i of u minus w you have partial j of phi is equal to f uh, minus or let's make it plus aij of x0 minus aij of x partial i u partial j phi uh -huh. so this this term just came from this one moving to the other side okay so let's say now, if we have some kind of a continuity assumption on A, then we can estimate this one. So we can sort of control how big this is. Now, um, and then using sort of like things that you know from constant coefficient equations, we can uh, say something about this term. Uh, so in essence, uh, that is sort of the guiding principle here for perturbation methods. You sort of... Um, the idea is the solutions to constant coefficient equations are sort of close to solutions to constant oh the solution sorry the solution to um uh, equations <laughs> the solution to the equation where the coefficients also depend on x they are sort of close to uh, solutions to constant coefficient equations provided that they're sort of near each other so that's like the guiding principle so that's why there we call them perturbation methods now, i'm being very sloppy here i guess with my calculations but when we come to these um i'll be more careful and more rigorous in my calculations but that really is the essence here so that's why we need some continuity assumption in j because that is sort of where we're perturbing uh-huh so that we're sort of close to constant co uh, solutions to constant coefficient equations Okay, so we're gonna go back to this again. Aha, uh -huh, so don't worry. Okay, the next set of methods are gonna be um, iteration methods. And these are uh, these were obtained by uh, the Georgie Moser. Um, I am not sure if Nash did an iteration technique to prove his result, uh -huh, but these are the people that were able to um, get Hilder regularity of weak solutions to quasi-linear elliptic PDEs. I think Nash did it for the parabolic case. I haven't actually said, uh, have looked into Nash paper, but I've seen like treatments on the Georgie and Moser's technique. And what's good about them is that um, they do not rely on per perturbations say so they do not rely on perturbations and in fact um because they're freeing themselves from this approach they don't need continuity a uh, strong continuity assumptions on the coefficient matrix they actually just need it to be l infinity so no continuity assumptions continuity assumptions on a and they also don't necessarily use linearity do not use linearity so uh, I, their methods are we're able to handle the case of quasi-linear pdes which are uh, non-linear in some sense okay so the book is going to talk about these two things and that is what we're going to do uh we're going to show uh hilda regularity using perturbations methods first and the flavor is also sort of kind of similar to shouter estimates uh which also uh they he he 
Uh, I think he also does uh, this sort of trick where you uh, compare it to solutions to constant coefficient equations. And then we're going to look at iteration methods. And in fact, these techniques aren't unique to just this area. I've seen, I've seen someone working on um, eigenvalue estimates, on manifolds, and they were using some kind of a Moser iteration technique to get some, uh, some bound that they, that they need. So uh, the techniques in particular uh, here are, are flexible enough that you can use it in, like in other places. Okay, so there is some value in that. Okay. So let's uh, move on to the agenda for today. So what we want to look into are the growth of local integrals. Okay. So this is the first section of the third chapter of Hamlin and Lin's book. Okay. So let's see. So let's recall our weak solutions. They are sort of defined globally. Uh -huh. Globally in the sense that um, their definition involves testing with a test function. And this testing is an integral of some sort. Uh -huh. So it involves integrals. Now continuity is a local, sort of a local concept, yet like you sort of look at neighborhoods of a point. So it's a local thing. Now what we want is we want to show continuity of weak solutions. Weak solutions being defined globally, we want to obtain like a local property for them. Okay. So the bridge uh, is going to be... Uh, let's write it down. So the bridge would be... Uh, by looking at the growth of certain integrals, mm -hmm, this can give us insight as to how we get Hilder continuity. Uh -huh. And functions that satisfy this particular growth of integrals, uh, they belong in what is called uh, a campanato space. So this is what you'll see in the literature. We're not really gonna like define them here, but uh, in essence, uh, the assumptions that we're going to impose on the integrals, uh, precisely those are what we call functions in a campanato space. And the cool thing is um, information seem in something that is seemingly global gives us information that is local. Okay, something like that, okay. So just some housekeeping here. Um, oh, let's use the previous one. We still have space. So just some housekeeping here. We uh, Omega is bounded, open, connected, subset of Rn. Mm -hmm. And for our purposes, n is bigger than 2. And for u in L1, of omega, so just a notation, ux0r is defined as the average. So it's the average in the ball centered at x0 of radius r of u. So this is 1 over the, the big measure of the ball, uh, integral over the ball of u. Uh -huh. Okay, so now we go to the first big result. So the first result is this one. Okay, let's use this. So theorem one, um, so suppose that u is in L2 uh, and that it satisfies um, the integral over the ball, radius r centered at x0 of u minus its average is less than or equal to some m squared, some positive constant m, r to the m plus 2 alpha for any, um, this is to be consistent with notation, this is just brx, for any ball containing omega, 
where uh, for, uh, for some alpha in zero one. Okay, so this is our assumption. We're assuming that we just have something in L two. Uh -huh. and L two functions can be weird. Okay, they're defined almost everywhere. But uh, if we have this and we have a control on their uh, uh, sort of deviation from averages, uh -huh, some kind of a deviation from the average. If we have a control in this, control meaning to say that it's bounded by this, uh -huh, and this here is uh, the radius of that ball, and then we can say something about u that um, uh, it is Hilder continuous, but I think strictly speaking, what that means is that it's um, equal almost ever to a continuous function. Uh, don't take my word for that. I think that is what it was, for example, like when uh, Evans was talking about um, the Moray inequality, something like that maybe. But okay, for our purposes, we're going to say that then u is in c alpha of omega and for a set omega prime uh, compactly containing omega we can say something more we have a quantitative uh, description so we have that the soup of u in omega prime plus the soup of u of x minus u of y over x minus y to the alpha soup over all x not equal to y, x, y in omega prime is less than or equal to some constant c times m plus the L2 norm of u in omega. Here, c only depends on n alpha omega and omega prime. Uh -huh. So uh, this is the sort of infinity norm in um, omega prime, and this is the Hilder semi-norm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this, this being uh, finite uh, tells you that it's uh, in C alpha. So, it's C alpha in every omega prime compact it contains can be C alpha in omega. Okay, okay. So, before we sort of prove this, uh, let's try to pick it apart because uh, it kind of looks like uh, a lot and... Uh, I can understand uh, the experience that when you sort of like look at the theorem and then you're like, what does it mean? And when then when you realize like what the theorem is saying, you're going to be like, well, how did they come up with the hypothesis for that? Like, So let's try to sort of gently pick it apart uh, just to make sense out of the assumptions. So uh, what I'd like to think... So I'm going to call it a heuristic, quote-unquote heuristic. Okay, so let's see. So the integral condition, so here, the integral condition that we have here, uh, let's take a look at this. So let's divide by r to the n. So if you do that, what you get is, note that um, the volume of the ball of radius r, this is sort of... Uh, gonna behave or or the order is of the order r to the m so that the integral condition there actually tells you that the average of the squared deviations from the average is uh, controlled by something of the or uh, form cr to the 2 alpha okay now, um, this uh, sort of feels familiar. Uh -huh. What do we know from real analysis? From real analysis, if this is not here, we know that by the Lebesgue differentiation theorem, this goes to zero. So, and the Lebesgue, so the Lebesgue differentiation theorem sort of also tells you that uh, up to a subsequence, the averages converge to your function. So, um, this would give you control on uh, how f um, big the deviation or the distance is between like the function and its average. Uh -huh. 
So it's no accident that this is 2 alpha because at some point we're gonna take square root so it just becomes r to the alpha and it's no accident that this is alpha and that would give us the alpha regularity that we uh, that eventually we'll get. So the idea is the integral condition gives you this control on these quantities that are sort of familiar from the Beck's differentiation theorem and that uh, result gives sort of gives you um, a way to talk about the distance between uh, just uh, these things here. Okay, so that's the first observation. The next observation is, okay, so if we want to estimate this, uh -huh, uh, by triangle inequality, we can sort of control this by, we insert uh, this little thing here, insert another thing there and then we measure these uh -huh. now because of this sorry because of this one these things hopefully can be controlled by something like this where r is going to be the distance between x and y similar things can be said for this one uh -huh. So the idea is because you have information here which sort of tells you information about this one, you can say something about these three and that what you want to say is that this is sort of going to be like some CR to the alpha where R here is going to be like X minus Y, uh -huh, which gives you Hilder regularity. Okay, so that's like the the sort of like heuristic maybe uh -huh. because if you just sort of look at this one it looks kind of messy but that is sort of what it means uh -huh. okay 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 so let's start with the proof um, okay so so we let R0 be the distance between omega prime to the outer boundary. So let's draw a picture here. Um, let's say this is omega. Okay, let's zoom that a bit. Uh -huh, uh, let's say this is R0, uh, omega prime, sorry. R0 be the distance of this set to the boundary, which is this one. So R0, let's say this is where it's closest. Uh, mm -hmm, something like that. Okay. Now, okay, so let's see. So the proof is going to be divided into two parts. Um, the first one is to show that the supremum of the absolute value of u in omega prime, this is uh, finite. And the other one is to show that uh, it's actually Hilder continuous. It's in C alpha of omega prime. Okay. Now, uh, I just kind of want to point out that interestingly, um, uh, a lot of the more challenging arguments for this one comes into uh, into proving uh, the first one that it's actually bounded in something compactly contained in omega and this is sort of similar to when we go to the um, iteration methods to prove Hilder regularity where um, the de Georgie and Moser one uh, the, the the meat actually comes uh, into proving that the solutions are in L infinity of like a smaller ball in the, uh, in the, in the domain. Okay, so it was just like a nice observation. Uh -huh. Okay, so let's, let's try and prove one. Now to prove one, what is the idea? Okay, so the idea here is um, uh, for x in omega prime, we want to estimate absolute value of u of x. Now by triangle inequality, this is going to be less than or equal to u of x minus, okay, so I'm going to sneak this in plus this one. And the reason that I'm doing that is um, hopefully, well not hopefully, we will see that because of the integral condition that we impose on u, we can sort of control this by, uh, this is something that's going to be like controlled by something like r to the alpha, 
And this one here, uh, this is an average. So you have absolute value of an average. You can uh, estimate this by uh, uniformly by the L2 norm of U in omega. So that would give us the L infinity estimate. Okay, so let's go and do that. Okay. So let's see, do I have space here? Okay. So we let x0 uh, x zero be in omega prime and we fix two radii r1 r2 okay so that when we look at um uh so that everything stays inside omega i think okay we're gonna see okay then Let's look at this quantity here, ux0 r1 minus ux0 r2 squared. Uh -huh. And then let's just uh, sort of look into what can we say about this. We're going to explain later why um, we're looking at this particular term, uh, but for now, bear with me. Okay. So uh, using the triangle inequality, and in fact, uh, Young's inequality as well, this is going to be less than or equal to, and we're going to show it, twice of um, u of x minus u x zero r1 squared plus u of x minus u x zero r2 squared. And remember that these things are averages. Uh -huh. For um, x in the ball of radius r1 centered at x zero. Okay. Now, um, yeah, in the book, they don't actually show that why this is true. And at first, I was like, okay, um, why is this true? So, like what I said earlier, uh, we're going to flesh out a lot of the details here. The purpose of the channel, it's it's for like grad students who uh, I know share the frustration of trying to figure out like why is something true? Why is something uh, like some, some line true and some proof? Yes, and of course, if you want to like figure it out on your own, uh, uh, you're you're free to like pause the video and try and see. Uh -huh. uh, it is it is fun, and there is actually value in trying to like work out the details on your own. Okay, but okay, so let's see why this is true. So this is true because if you look at this one by the triangle inequality, this is less than or equal to this plus this one. Okay, let me just fix my ad pad. So that when we square it, what do you get? You get a minus b squared less than or equal to a minus c squared plus twice of a minus c. Oops, why is it doing that? Sorry. Okay, a minus c, b minus c plus, oops, my pencil is being buggy, plus b minus c squared, okay. So we just squared the previous inequality. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to use Young's inequality to estimate this term. So by Young's inequality, the product of two non-negative things is bounded above by, so this is Young's inequality for p equals 2, uh, 1 half a minus c squared plus 1 half b minus c squared. Uh -huh. So you multiply it by two and then combine like terms, you get the inequality that you want. Uh -huh. So uh, you're actually going to see if you're doing analysis, PDEs, estimates and stuff like that, you're actually going to see Hilder's inequality, Young's inequality, Young's inequality with Epsilon, Cauchy-Schwartz and stuff like that in a lot of places. Uh -huh. So triangle inequality and all. So they are the bread and butter of analysis. Okay. So what we're going to do now is, let's see, let's see. So what we have here is, we have a control on how far the averages are from each other. And they're controlled, this is standard uh, triangle inequality, they're controlled by this quantity here. Now, if I integrate this, know that this is a constant. So integrating that would just give me a constant times the volume of the ball. Okay, but if I integrate here, uh huh. Uh, I would be able to estimate that quantity because it sort of looks like it looks like the thing that we have uh, at the start of the theorem. So the hypothesis actually gives us a control on how big these quantities are. Okay. 
So that is what we're gonna do uh, here. We're gonna integrate with respect to x. So I'm gonna try and make my handwriting uh, nice. Integrating with respect to x in uh, br1 centered at x0. What you get is, so on one side, it's just a constant. And so you get the constant times the measure of the ball, then just divide by the measure of the ball. So we have here um, u of x0 r1 minus u of x0 r2 squared. It's going to be less than, oh, okay, squared. It's going to be less than or equal to, so twice, um, uh, C is some, some constant dependent on n times r1 to the n. So this is going to be the measure of the ball of, with radius r1. Multiply 2, so integral over r1 of u minus uh, ux0 r1 squared plus integral over the ball of radius r2 u minus ux0 r2 squared, where uh, note that r1 is less than r2, so that uh, the integral of this over ball of radius r1 is less than or equal to the integral over this bigger ball. Okay, and now we use uh, the condition that we have on these integrals. So this is going to be less than or equal to some uh, some uh, let's write it as 2 times constant dependent on n. Uh, you have r1 to the n. Multiply 2. Uh, by hypothesis, this is less than m squared times n to the uh, times r raised r1 raised to m plus 2 alpha plus m squared r2 raised to n plus 2 alpha. So this is just by hypothesis. Estimating like these terms. Okay, so, uh, okay, so, what do we have here? So we have that this is going to be less than or equal to this one. Okay, okay. So what is the plan? Let's try and sort of write that out. Okay. Uh, just give me a sec. Okay. So this term here will actually help us, um, no, not, not just that term, I'm sorry. This whole inequality would actually help us showing that ux0r uh, is Cauchy. And here r is a, dec uh, a decreasing sequence. So r goes to zero. Mm -hmm. So it's Cauchy so that it would converge to some like limit. Uh -huh. Let's call it u hat of x zero, okay? But we also know uh, that the averages for an L1 function, and u is an L1 function, that the averages would converge to the function itself in L1. So up to a subsequence, you have almost everywhere convergence, something like that. So you sort of also know that um, this converges to the function in L1. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Now, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Now, from, from this as well, because it's coming from this estimate, uh, you, aside from the fact that you have this convergence, you can actually make this sort of... You can say that it's something that is quantitative because you have an idea of how fast the convergence goes. So that combining these, uh -huh, so combining information about this, information about this, uh -huh, we can sort of, um, let's see what I have here. We can sort of say something about the convergence of this to, uh, to you. Uh -huh. And the hope is that we get something that is uniform and quantitative. Actually, I think uh, the way that this would go, we will have some kind of a quantitative estimate, uh, which is like independent of, excuse me, um, of um, 
of x so we we get uh some kind of a uniform sort of convergence although uh we will see so <laughs> don't take my word for it yet okay but that is the idea um the reason that we are doing these estimates is because again uh looking at this estimate would allow us to assert that this sequence is squishy uh -huh. but we also know that the averages converges to the function itself in l1 now, this estimate gives us uh, quantitative information about uh, this convergence. To get, so together with that, we, we get this information uh, on this convergence, convergence to you, okay? So, I'm sorry, <laughs> that was a bit um, a, sh a shaky explanation, okay? So, uh, let's go about uh, proving that um, for a decreasing sequence uh, of positive r's going to zero, that in fact it is squishy. Okay. So uh, we let r, use this color, let r be less than or equal to r zero. Okay. We set r1 to be r over 2 to the i plus 1, and we set r2 to be r over to the i. Uh -huh. Okay, now um, if we just plug in those r values here, uh -huh, what we get is, so just substitute those, what we get is ux0 of 2 to the minus i plus 1r minus u of x0, 2 to the minus i uh, r. So these are just um, R1 and R2, okay? So squared, this is less than or equal to a constant dependent on N times M squared. And then what do we have here? We have R1, which is 2 to the minus I plus 1 times R raised to minus N. Uh-huh. Multiplied to um, R1 raised to negative n plus alpha uh, plus 2 alpha plus r2 raised to negative n plus 2 alpha so it kind of looks messy but what i did here was i just substituted substituted uh these are one r2 values in the previous inequality okay so uh what what happens here um this term would cancel out with, oh, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be n, not minus n. Okay, so this term would cancel out with this term, and so with this one, uh-huh. So we're just going to be left with powers of 2 raised to, like, minus i alpha times r to the alpha. So it's just algebra. Okay, so that is what I want to say next. So, um... What we get is ux0, 2 to the minus i plus 1, r minus ux0, 2 to the minus i r. And then we take square roots. Uh, is less, uh, less than or equal to a constant dependent on n. And 2 to the minus i plus 1 times alpha, r to the alpha. That's why it's not 2 alpha anymore. We have 2 alphas here. Take square roots. Just alpha. Okay, so it's just algebra. Multiply these, uh, and then take the square root. Okay, so we have this sort of basic bound. Now, um, we want to show that this is squishy. Uh -huh. So, uh, for, uh, should we, let's use next page. So for h less than k, uh -huh, let's look at u of x0, uh, 2 to the minus h r, minus u of x0, 2 to the minus kr. Mm -hmm. And so to show that it's squishy, we need to show that this goes to 0 as k and h go to infinity. Okay? So what do we do? So this is a standard technique in analysis. You do some kind of a repeated uh, triangle inequality. So because in the previous one, you have an estimate for sort of adjacent things in the sequence, so you just sort of insert things in between. So let's just sort of um, spell that out. So this is less than or equal to, so you have u of x0 here. Excuse me. 
2 to the minus hr minus u of x0, uh, 2 to the minus uh, h plus 1 times r, okay? And then you have um, u of x0, 2 to the minus h plus 1, r minus u of x0 2 to the minus um, h plus 2 r and then you go on until you reach u of x0 2 to the minus k minus 1 r minus u of x0 2 to the minus 1 k uh, just 2 to the minus k r okay and uh, we know how to estimate each of these terms Okay, so this is going to be less than or equal to, okay, let me just check my notes. Uh, some constant dependent on n times m times r to the alpha. Okay, so 2 to the minus h plus 1 alpha plus 2 to the minus, uh, what's next, h plus 2 alpha up to 2 to the minus k alpha. Okay, let's factor out um, 2 to the minus, uh, sorry, let's factor out 2 to the minus h plus 1 alpha, so I'm writing it down here. So we're left with 1 plus what? 2 to the minus alpha, is that right? Yes. Plus uh, 2 to the minus 2 alpha up to 2 to the minus h minus, uh, sorry, k minus h minus 1 alpha. So I just factored, I just factored this term out, okay? And know that uh, all of the terms are now negative, okay? So I can write that as some constant dependent on n uh, over uh, 2 to the h plus 1 alpha, uh, mr to the alpha sum i from 0 to h minus k minus 1 of 1 over 2 to the i alpha this is less than or equal to let's just copy this uh-huh to the same thing but instead of it being a finite sum infinity because uh, these things are positive uh, I know that this is convergent so, so also that is uh, another standard trick when you're uh, writing estimates. So you can estimate it by the infinite sum provided that everything, of course, is not negative. So we can write what this is. So this is just, what is this? Uh, first term, 1 starts at 0. Uh, 1 minus 1 over uh, 2 to the alpha. So it's just a constant dependent on alpha. Mm -hmm. So this is less than or equal to a constant dependent on n and alpha, mr to the alpha over 2 to the h plus 1 times alpha. So what are, why are we doing this again? So we're showing, so we have that this is greater than or equal to this. Uh -huh. So we're trying to show that this sequence is Cauchy. So let's, let's just write that down so we don't forget. So copy this copy, paste here, uh -huh. copy this, paste it here, okay, so this is uh, for h less than k, so note that this term here goes to 0 as h goes to infinity, and as h goes to infinity, it forces k to go to infinity as well, uh -huh. so that tells us that indeed, the sequence is Cauchy. So ux0 2 to the minus ir i from uh, even from 0, 0 to infinity, this is Cauchy. Okay? Okay. Um, so um, uh, hi, uh, sorry about that. There's just some technical difficulty, so we have to change the camera. Okay, so going back. Um, I was saying that the book was insisting that the choice is independent of, of R. Uh -huh. And we're, they don't really play, uh, uh, work out the details as much. So uh, we're going to show that briefly here why that is so. Mm -hmm. 
So we write uh, u hat of x0 to be the limit um, as I go to infinity of the averages u x0 2 to the minus um, i r. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, to show that um, it's independent of the choice of r, what we're going to do is we're going to choose a different r. Uh -huh. So we're going to show that that is still Cauchy. And um, sh uh, we're sh going to show that actually those two limits are the same. So let's use red. Uh -huh. So uh, let, so you choose a different r, let's call it r bar. Suppose it's less than r. Uh -huh. So from this, you know that u of x0, 2 to the minus i r bar, this is Cauchy in r. So that it would converge. So we're calling the limit v. So we let v to be the limit as i go to infinity of uh, the averages u x0, 2 to the minus uh, i uh, r bar. Okay? Okay, let's sort of just adjust this a bit. So now the goal is to show that v is equal to u hat of x0. And uh, the trick is uh, fairly straight for uh, standard. So you have u hat of x0 minus v. So again, the triangle inequality is going to be your friend here. So you insert certain things, things in between for which you be able to estimate each of those terms. So this is going to be less than or equal to u hat x0 minus the average x0 um, 2 to the minus i r plus uh, u v minus the average uh, at x0 radius 2 to the minus i r bar. And then you're left with um, u x0 uh, 2 to the minus i r minus u of x0 2 to the minus i r bar. Mm -hmm. Now, these the, the first two terms, uh, we know that they would go to 0 as I go to infinity, um, because it's precisely how uh, u hat x0 and v are defined. So now we just need to work a little bit on the last term. And to show that that goes to 0, we go back to a previous inequality that we had from not too long ago. It's this, uh, sorry, it's this one where we're comparing the distance between two averages and this is controlled by something. So this is what actually the book was referring to. And uh, at first I was like, okay, what do they mean? But this is what they mean, I think. Okay, so applying that inequality here, so let's use blue. So I can control this uh -huh, by some constant dependent on n, m squared, uh, we have 2 to the minus i r bar raised to minus n times 2 to the minus i r bar raised to m plus 2 alpha. So this is r1 plus uh, r2, 2 to the minus i r m plus 2 alpha. So I think I'm using it right, either this or the other. Uh, if it's supposed to be like the other way, it's more or less going to be fine. Uh, so doing the algebra, note that, so let's see, uh, this term here would cancel out with that term and so on. So just doing the algebra, you get uh, that this is controlled by a constant just dependent on n, uh, on r, r bar, uh, n, okay, even alpha, times uh, 2 to the 2 alpha raised to negative i. So where did that come from? It's from this term. So you have this term here multiplied to that term. So the n cancels out, you're left with 2 to the minus i times 2 uh, raised to 2 alpha. And what do we now do? So this uh, estimate goes to 0 as i goes to infinity. Okay, so that shows, so uh, this is independent of i. Uh -huh. It's controlled by quantities dependent on i that go to zero as i goes to infinity. So that tells you that uh, u hat of x zero is equal to v. So in fact, um, in the way that we have defined u hat, it's independent of the choice of r. Okay. 
Okay, okay, sorry. Let's just delete this. Do I have more here? I'm sorry. Okay. So how, what do we do next? Okay. So because of that, because that it's independent of R, uh, we're just going to write uh, u hat of x0 to be the limit as r goes to 0 of the average as ux0 r. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming from the estimates that we just derived to prove that um, the sequence of averages are actually uh, is actually Cauchy, you have this estimate here that you the distance to the average of this u hat x zero is less than or equal to c of n alpha m uh, r to the alpha, where the r here sort of comes from. So uh, in the estimates that we have before, it's in terms of like negative powers of two. But here, r sort of acts like um, 2 to the minus i times r here. Mm -hmm. And in the estimates that you have there, you have something like a constant times um, m squared. You have 2 to the minus i r to the 2 alpha, something like this. And uh, But this is not for squared quantity, so you don't have the 2, something like that. Okay? So this is sort of like um, uh, this one. <laughs> So it's a very kind of way we think, uh -huh, but this is what it is. Okay, so we have that. Okay. Okay, 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 we're making progress. Um, now, uh, recall that er, at the start of the proof, I was sort of trying to like tell us some kind of a heuristic. And remember, um, I said something like, well, we also know that the averages... Um, also converge to the function in L1, that is Lebesgue's differentiation theorem. So let's write that down. We also know that uh, the averages converge to u uh, in L1 uh, as r goes to 0. So this is just Lebesgue's differentiation theorem. Okay. So um, L1 convergence. Uh, if I remember correctly, e, just to be safe, uh, uh, e in the finite measure case, we're guaranteed the existence of a subsequence that is um, almost everywhere convergent. So uh, using the same trick that we have from, from, from previously, we can show that u is equal to u hat almost everywhere. So again, this guarantees existence of a subsequence that is almost everywhere convergent, but this converges to this, and this converges to that, so these two things are equal almost everywhere, okay? So you have u is equal to u hat almost everywhere, okay? So another observation here is um, you have that because of this thing here, you have that the, uni uh, that the convergence is uniform, uh -huh, as long, uh, because it's only this, this estimate here only depends on r. Mm -hmm. So you also have that the u x r's converges to u uh, uniformly uh, almost everywhere uniformly maybe I guess uh -huh, but the book calls it uniformly. I'm, I'm afraid I'm missing some maybe delicate new ones here uh -huh. but anyway so the averages also converge to u uniformly because um, of the uh, because of this one uh -huh, where the control that you have here only depends on R not in X and okay so what else another observation is that the map X to the average uh -huh, this is continuous so the averages as a function of X uh, they are continuous uh -huh. so what do we do now so you have uh, a uniform limit of continuous functions, so something from uh, undergraduate real analysis, you know that the limit must also be continuous. So that tells you that u is continuous. Or at least like has a continuous represent representative up to a set of measure zero, it's continuous. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. So now we show that uh, we, we obtain the, um, uh, the supreme bound. Okay, so let's do that. 
So for r less than r0, so note that u of x, so we do the trick that I uh, mentioned at the start of the video. This is less than or equal to, so you insert uh, the average uxr plus uxr. Mm -hmm. Now this term here, we know how to estimate this. It's this less than or equal to a constant times m r to the alpha. So this is just from uh, previous the previous one, okay? And, okay. So now how do we estimate this? So this is just going to be 1 over the measure of the ball of radius r. I'm just taking a shortcut notation here. Of u. Uh -huh. So this is less than or equal to 1 over the measure of the ball, measure of the ball times absolute value of the thing inside. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, my undergraduate uh, real analysis professor says something like it's sort of like the triangle inequality for integrals. So an integral is like a sum. So we're saying here that the absolute value of this sum is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute value, something like that. Okay. And then we use Hilder inequality to bring to lift this to L2. So this is less than or equal to one over the measure of the ball. Bleh, sorry, measure of the ball times the L2 norm of u times Br. The one half, uh -huh. so some measure dependent on r times the L2 norm of u. Uh -huh. So, let's see. This term is controlled by something that is independent of x. This term is just controlled by a constant dependent on the domains. Um, and this is... Uh, um, this is independent x, so this is independent of x here. Okay? So that gives us a supremum bound. So in particular, what we have is something like, uh -huh. uh, we can even push this, sorry, this is less than or equal to C M R is 0 to the alpha because R is 0 is uh, greater than or equal to R. Okay. Okay. Um, so what do we do now? So this tells us that the supremum of R less than or equal to some constant times m r0 to the alpha plus the L2 norm of u. Okay? So <laughs> all that work to show the supremum bound on u. Now, the, to show that it's actually Hilder continuous is easy. So a lot of the hard work is like um, showing that u is continuous first and then getting this bound. And a lot of work is put into obtaining a bound for this, a quantitative bound for this. And that's where we needed to consider like distances between averages and um, do this like Cauchy, prove that some sequence is Cauchy thing and that it's independent of the choice of R and all. Okay, but here on out, it's gonna be simpler. So uh, let's see. So for part two, we show that u is in C alpha. Okay, so to do that, so let x and y this in, be an omega bar, and we call r to be, which is less than, uh, and suppose that it's less than r0 over 2. And of course, we assume x is not equal to y. Okay? So we are going to do this trick, I'm sorry, uh, that uh, I mentioned earlier. So, we are going to estimate the difference between this by inserting the things, uh, and as probably would have guessed, it has something. It's gonna have something to to do with the averages. So this is uh, controlled by u of x. Uh -huh. We're gonna insert this thing here. U of y. Insert this thing here. And then u x to r minus u of y to r. So these are averages. Okay, um, so you might be wondering, like, uh, one, why? And two, uh, why to r? Okay, so to answer the first question, why? Um, it's because uh, at this point, we know how to estimate these terms. These are going to be um, controlled by something like r to the alpha. Even though there, there's a 2 there, it's fine. It's just a constant. Now, for the other one, 
um, uh, why it's not R instead of uh, why it why is it R instead of why is it two R instead of R um, so that we have a bit of room to wiggle okay so let l- let's let's draw the the figure and see okay so he's green uh, let's draw a ball oops <laughs> it's a badly drawn ball. Use the magic tool. Okay, and then suppose this is the center. This is X. And uh, suppose that this is the ball X centered at X of rage 2R. Mm-hmm. So let's just copy that. Okay, the wonders of technology. Paste. Okay, this looks somewhere halfway, right? Oops, okay. And then this is Y. Uh Uh-huh, Y, so this is the ball of radius 2R, centered at Y. Oops, wrong notation. Okay, now what can you say about the ball centered at x of radius r? So this thing, the distance from here to there, this is r, okay? This is also r, okay? So it's clear that, let's use purple. <laughs> um, close enough. Uh huh. So this is the ball centered at x of radius r. So is it clear that the ball centered at x of radius r is contained in the intersection between these two larger balls? Uh huh. So we are to answer my question earlier: why two r, not r? So we we have some kind of a wiggle room. Okay. So we have here 2R, X, 2R, Y, okay. Okay, so the goal now is to estimate this term. So, and we're almost done, we're almost done. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's go about estimating that final term. So for um, zeta, okay, I'm gonna draw my, okay, zeta, um, that intersection uh, we have the following okay so ux 2r minus ui 2r is less than or equal to so this is just the triangle inequality u of x 2r uh, minus u of zeta plus u of y 2r Minus u of zeta. Mm-hmm. So we do the same trick again. We integrate in. So we integrate uh, over zeta in this. I don't want to write it anymore. Just going to copy it. Copy. Paste. Okay. Okay. So doing that, note that again, uh, this is a constant here. So when you integrate, you just get the measure of something. Uh But, uh, so let's put that here and everything is squared. This is less than or equal to, so this too comes from the trick that we had earlier when you do the Young's inequality as well, uh, when you consider an estimate with squares. So that's where the two is coming from. Oops, sorry, over uh, the measure measure of the ball, and the reason we can do this is because put it in red. This is just like algebra. Um, the measure of the ball of radius r centered at x. This is less than or equal to the measure of the intersection. Uh huh. 
So when you take the reciprocals, you get the reverse um, inequality, okay? Okay, multiply to ball uh, centered at x to r. So note that this ball is bigger than the intersection, so you can push it, push it there, okay? And then you have here u minus ux to r squared, and then you do the same thing for the other one, y to r, u minus u, y to r squared. Okay, so we, we have like room to grow, okay? So let's see. Um, this thing here, mm -hmm, this is going to be like, um, this whole term is going to be like r to the minus n, this is going to be like a constant times r to the m plus 2 alpha, r plus m plus 2 alpha, so that combining everything, the uh, n's would cancel out, you get r to the 2 alpha. So this is less than or equal to a constant dependent on n and alpha, m squared, r to the 2 alpha. Okay? So taking the square roots then, uh, taking the square roots would give you that this uh, difference is bounded by something r to the alpha. So adding this estimate to the ones that we have previously, in particular this one, uh, adding it to that, we finally get uh, that u of x minus u of y is less than or equal to some constant times m x minus y to the alpha. Note that r was x minus y. So we're working with the case when x minus y, the distance between them is less than r not over 2. Okay, so fairly easy uh, as compared to the other one. Now the final case is even easier. So here um, we are in the case where the distance between x and y is less than r0 over 2. We're almost there, just the final one. So for the other case, so for when this happens, greater than r0 over 2, okay, so what do we get? So you get u of x minus u of y, uh -huh. uh, triangular inequality, note that x and y are in omega prime, this is less than or equal to twice um, the supremum of uh, u in omega prime, and we have an estimate for this. Uh, care of uh, step one, so this is less than or equal to a constant times m r0 to the alpha plus the L2 norm of u, okay? So what do we do now? What, what do you think? Well, look at uh, this. So we are in this case where this is controlled by this. Uh -huh. So eventually we want this to be controlled by an alpha power of this, okay? So... It makes sense to pull out this one here because this is going to be controlled by x minus y. So less than or equal to c r0 to the alpha, you have m plus 1 over r0 to the alpha. L2. Yes, uh -huh. which is less than or equal to because of the assumption that we have here. This is less than or equal to uh, some c. Oops, sorry. Okay. And then we choose which is bigger, m or 1 over r0 to the alpha. So we get a constant c dependent on n, alpha, r0, uh, maybe n as well. Uh -huh. Let's just call it a constant. It doesn't depend on x and y. So a constant times m plus the L2 norm. Uh -huh. Times x minus y to the alpha. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. So this covers the other case. So what have we done? We have shown uh, boundedness and then Hilder uh, continuity. And that ends our proof. Okay. So one final remark uh -huh, before we end this uh, discussion. Uh, the quantities, uh, the growth, uh, the integrals whose growth are we looking into, they, uh, they look sort of familiar. So let's write them down, okay? So we have something like, um, something like this, right? Working with this, xr squared, the 
Aha. Now, this that's familiar, and in fact, um, we can control this uh, in the case where u is in h1. So we can con control it by the gradient, the altitude of the gradient of u, and that is Poincaré's inequality. So by Poincaré, we know that this is less than or equal to c of n, some constant just dependent on n, times r squared times uh, the L2 norm of the gradient. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so why am I, uh, where am I getting here? What am I getting here? Okay, so from before, what we were saying is if you have control on how, uh, how these grow in terms of r, then um, you get Hilder continuity. And now I'm saying that, well, even without that knowledge, um, I already know that if I'm working with H1 functions, W2, W1, 2 functions, I can control this by the gradient. So as it turns out, it will be useful to estimating the gradient in, instead of things like these. Uh -huh. So my punchline is, uh, okay, what condition should we impose on grad u so that we have the growth that we want on this term so that we get Hilder continuity? And that's easy. Uh -huh. So you already have two here. Okay, so we want this to be less than or equal. We want that m squared there. r to the n minus 2. This would cancel out this plus 2 alpha. Uh -huh. So that this is going to be less than or equal to a constant r to the m plus 2 alpha. And what do we know? Uh -huh. What do we know if this has this growth? u would be Hilder continuous. Okay, and that leads us to the, corol to the next corollary. Uh -huh. um, should we write that? Okay, u in h1, uh -huh. and suppose you have um, m squared r to the n minus 2 plus 2 alpha, what you get is u is in uh, C alpha. And in particular, for something compactly contained in omega, you have the bound sup u in omega prime plus um, the Hilder, let's just call it the Hilder semi norm of u, uh, alpha prime, uh, alpha omega prime. So this is the soup of u of x minus u of y over x minus y to the alpha. This is bounded by some constant times m plus u l2 of omega. Okay, so that ends our discussion for today. Uh, so to recap, what we have, so what we want is to eventually prove um, Hilder regularity of solutions to uh, elliptic PDEs in divergent form. And we're going to do that in two ways. Um, which is the same uh, way that Han and Lin uh, did it in their book. Uh, uh, so we're going to do it by perturbation methods where you compare it to solutions to constant coefficient equations, and then we do it by iterative methods by the George and Moser. So we haven't seen those yet. Uh -huh. What we did for today is to sort of give a um, characterization or more, more of a sufficient condition to guarantee Hilder continuity based on information on the growth of certain integrals. And that makes um, sense for weak solutions, again, because weak solutions are sort of defined globally They're in terms of integrals, but continuity is a local concept. So this is some, some kind of a nice, like, um, bridge. Okay. So, yeah, there's that. So for the next uh, couple of videos, we'll be finally exploring uh, the Hilder regularity of uh, solutions to divergence form elliptic PDEs under uh, continuity assumptions on the coefficient matrix. Uh -huh. There are going to be some technical lemmas that uh, we are just going to skip and focus mostly on the um, perturbation part. Okay, so uh, thank you for uh, bearing uh, with me uh -huh. and I hope you uh, come back again and um, uh, we can learn uh, together uh, more about PDs. Okay, thank you.